Okay, lesson five will be in John chapter two. So I hope that uh, everyone's had a chance to review uh, that passage, and we will uh, spend some time talking and thinking about the uh, the miracle at Cana. Before uh, before we begin that conversation this morning, we'll start with a start with a word of prayer. Jeff, would you mind to lead that first prayer for us? Amen. So in the context of our, uh, of our study this quarter, all of our lessons are accounts uh, in the life of Jesus, but what, what kind of specific perspective are we, uh, are we taking this quarter? Jesus says the word, and what does that, what does that mean? So what, what perspective does that mean? What are we trying to accomplish here when we say Jesus is the Word? He's part of the Godhead. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So as we study these things, if Jesus is the Word, what does that mean to us? The truth? Okay. For sure? It's communicating something. That's what words do, right? What we study about Jesus today in John chapter 2 communicates something about God. God is communicating something to us. Obviously, he does that through the written word, through the pen of men like John and Mark and, and, and Peter and Paul. But he also, the ultimate, the ultimate communication of, of God, his word was communicated in, in, in true literal sense in his son. And so what do we uh, what do we learn about God from the interactions of Jesus. Um, and so that, that'll be, uh, as we continue through this class, that is our, that is our intent. John chapter 2, the miracle at Cana. The first question that we, all, we always begin with, it kind of sparks discussion, is, as you had a chance to read this passage, what do you notice, what did you notice in this passage that struck you as significant, or you'd never noticed before? What, what stood out to you as you read this passage? Something that stood out to me, and I guess it's very obvious, but I have a lot of work to do, so I just never thought about it. Yes. But in verse 5, I mean, no one knows him better than his mother. Well, that's a, that's a great place to start. So Mary is a central figure in this story, and... It's very clear, as, as Jeff said, that no one knows Jesus better than his mother. We, there is a long period, right, where we do not, we just don't have a lot of information about Jesus' life between 12 and, I'm not going to fight with you about what age we're at here, but between 12 and about 30, we, we just don't have a lot of information about what happened during those years. I mean, it's pretty, it's a blank canvas. Um, yes. Yes, we'll talk a lot about his relationship to his mother, which is very crucial, I think, to uh, to this to this passage. And so that's a that's a very important point. What we're, we're speculating here, but I think informed speculation, and I think it's part of, as, as Jeff said, part of what makes this account interesting and unique. What what would you expect Mary's experience with Jesus would have been over the past eighteen years, since he was twelve? It's the last time we. Kind of the last time, well, we, we, we talked a little bit about um, his temptation last week, but the, in, in the life with his family, the last time we saw Jesus was 12 years old in the temple. We're now 30-ish. What, what do we expect Mary's experience through Jesus to have been over the last 18 years? Mary's brothers 
So there's there, So there's something uncommon, right, that, that she would have expected. Why would she have expected it? Because she knew she told her she was going to Yeah, I mean, she kind of, I don't know if y'all remember this, she got, got pregnant spontaneously. <laughs> it's kind of like she knew, she, she knew there was something going on. And then, and then what, what else? There was, there was something about yeah, as we, as we move forward in the narrative, she approached Jesus on purpose here. Um, she knew that he could do something about it, um, to, to Tara's point. I think we can expect that she has seen over the last 18 years that Jesus has matured. Like I, I, I don't know that there's any evidence that she's seen any miracles. John seems to indicate this was this was, this may have been. We're not, we're not sure, but this may have been the first time that that has been displayed. But she's certainly seen wisdom. She's certainly seen understanding and insight and spiritual maturity. Right? She's certainly seen those things. And so I, I'm, you know, whether whether she thought Jesus was going to perform a miracle here or whether like he's just the smartest guy I know, he'll figure a way out of this. I'm not 100% clear. It certainly seems to indicate that she expected a miracle in her words in verse 5. Um, do whatever he tells you. They have no wine and do whatever he tells you. Certainly seems that she expected something, but, you know, it's a little bit unclear. Again, is Jesus is just the smartest person she knows, and he always figures the, the wise and understanding way out of difficult situations. He'll figure a way out of this. But Mary knows him better than anybody. I like, I like where Jeff started. Yes, sir. Mary, she, like in verse 5, that he had story. Yes. Like so Mary certainly, you know, we don't know exactly what's in her mind here, but it wouldn't be surprising that she was, thinking back to what Simeon said and what Anna said. And we, we read some of those things from the, the very first days of Jesus' life, some of the things that were prophesied to her. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising that some of, those things, uh, some of those things were on our mind. So this relationship between Jesus and his mother is prominent in the story for sure. Yes, sir. So this is this is kind of the maybe the first example. I think it's a good insight. She recognizes there is a problem she can't fix. Um, and I think there's some very deep implications to that. Um, she recognizes there's a problem she can't fix. Why was this a problem? Yeah, this is um, you know. Again, there's so much of this story that's kind of steeped in the, the culture of the day. It's kind of hard to read this in 21st century, um, you know, our culture and expectations and how weddings go today. You kind of, it, it's helpful, I think, to have a little bit of insight into, into what first century Jewish weddings would have been like. And so, based on, based on your study and things you've heard in the past, tell me a little bit about that. What, what, would, this, what, would, this, what would this wedding have been like? <laughs> Longer than yours? <laughs> so, so how long is long? Maybe a week, right? Um, and uh, again, maybe you've heard some of this, and I think some other Bible stories become meaningful and significant here, but there is an engagement period, right, that could last a year that, that the, the groom would go and... and uh, speak to the to the bride's family, and they would be engaged. But there was this there was this period after that, this long engagement period. And what's happening during that period? You may know. The groom is building their house. The groom is preparing the place where they're going to live. They are separating from the parents' house and they're moving into their own place. I go to prepare a place for you. Is what we should be thinking about that. The groom is literally preparing the place where they're going to live. That's what happens during this long engagement. They've, they've made a commitment. 
a commitment, by the way, that can only be broken by divorce. It's a legal binding. So, like, there's, there's this long commitment. And during that time, literally, the groom is preparing the place. And so think about all this has already happened. It's a long process that's culminated in this week-long celebration. Okay? So it's a big deal. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, very, very, very good point. So if you look at verse 12, and, I, and we included verse 12 in our, in our reading here intentionally, that Jesus' family appears to have been with him, um, at, least his, at least his brothers, and, and I think best understood in that passage is earthly brothers. So we know his mother is there. It appears his family was there. Um, it could have been some family connection there. It appears that Mary... Not sure what role she had in the wedding, but she knew what was going on. Um, she, she was in the inner circle somehow um, and knew what was going on. So who were the bride and groom? We don't know. That's kind of one of the things that's interesting here. Well, you know, the Bible doesn't see fit to record for us who, who's getting married. But it was somebody, we can, we can be pretty certain it was somebody that Mary was in, intimately familiar with. Um, Jesus was at least acquainted with. Um, and, and his brothers and his his brothers and perhaps sisters were there as well as his disciples. Yes, sir. So, so I, I struggle with this a little bit. Um, so going most of the passage, mine was more of a question, but I never really asked the question. I read this before. Um, but it's clear that he's serving that his mother's gone into heaven. That, that's clear to me. Bothering me that that would be his only purpose. Only doing Yes. And I, I'm struggling that the only reason he's in here is either because he, his mother told him to do it. Um, I was trying to find the reason. And, and maybe like you said, verse 11 may help you better. All his disciples gained more faith in verse 11. It seemed like. He didn't want anybody else to know that he was doing it. Um, so anyway, that, that's for thought. I have no answer to that. That's not an answer that we need right now. I think, I think that Ron has, has hit on one of the key tensions here that I think that we have to, we got to wrestle with um, as, we, as we talk about this passage. And that is, I'm going to back up for one second, and I'm going to get back to there. We know that there is this celebration. We talked about the importance of weddings in that culture. And by the way, what do we, what do we not, don't have a ton of insight here, but what size town are we talking about in Cana? Do we know? It's not very big. We're, we're talking about a pretty small community. This is the biggest thing that's going to happen in Cana this year. Okay? So, I mean, like, that's, that's not an exaggeration. That's literally the biggest thing that's going to happen in Cana this year. So we got the, the biggest event that's going to happen in this town that your family is responsible for, and you have this pretty significant embarrassment. And by the way, part of the groom's responsibility is not just preparing the house, but also preparing for this ceremony. And so you can imagine, how are you going to provide for my daughter if you can't even prepare for this wedding kind of implications of not having enough wine for the entire celebration. So there's a lot more packed in here than just, you know, whoops, we ran out of drinks. There's a, there's a lot of, again, we, again our, our culture, we may not, fully grasp all that, but there's a, there's a really, really significant implications to not being significantly prepared. So all that to the side. So then we get to the, what I think is one of the key, um, key issues here that we got to wrestle with. Why did he do this? Um, why did Jesus do this? And, and specifically, I want to mention, answer that question in the context of What was the first temptation of Satan that we read about the last time that we had class together? What was that first temptation? Turn stones into bread. bread. Use your miraculous ability to turn something that is um, less desirable into something that will nourish and satisfy. 
Okay? Um, use your miraculous abilities to do that. This is not dissimilar, right? Turning water to wine is not entirely dissimilar from turning stones to bread and using your miraculous abilities to do that. Why was one a temptation from Satan and one an invitation that Jesus took? That, I think, is a key question that we, we kind of forced to, to wrestle with and, and helps us better understand the situation. So why was one clearly from Satan and not okay, and this one was okay? One from Satan, one from Satan. So that's an important point. Yes, I agree. And this one is so that people can believe. Okay, so this one was, that's verse 11, right? That, uh, that his disciples believed in him. So that, that is a distinction. Yes, so that, that, I think you guys have both hit on it. One, there's nobody else around in the wilderness, right? That would have been clearly self-serving. There's no one else to, to benefit from that. This one, who, who benefited in, verse, in, in this miracle? Who benefited? The disciples benefited, verse 11. I mean, we might first think specifically about the groom and the groom's family, that, you know, they avoided embarrassment. And, and there's some, I think there's some truth to that. Like, they benefited from that. But verse 11, you know, certainly goes in that context also. So I think that's a good question to talk about. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, a, a, a manifestation of his glory. Yeah, would that, would that have occurred in the wilderness? Yeah, to Sam's point, that would have been self-serving. No one, it wouldn't have been to manifest his glory. It wouldn't, would, that, the, the purposes are very different. They seem similar on the surface, but the, 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 the purpose of them uh, was very different. Good, good thoughts. Yeah, it seems like from the text, there, there weren't a lot of people that really knew what had happened, right? Um, at least that's, that's the way I see the text. The servants knew, the disciples knew, his mother knew, but clearly even the, the ringleader, the headmaster, or whatever, <laughs> I don't know what, the, what your version calls the, the guy who, who tasted the wine, the master of the feast. I mean, the guy that was running the show didn't know. Um, so th how many people actually knew um, but the servants and the disciples certainly did was Jesus planning on doing this when he showed up that day Roger says yes why would he have said my hour has not yet come This was a, uh, you know, John seems to be laying out for us very clearly the timeline of this first kind of public week of Jesus. If you go back to, to chapter 1, he lays out day by day. This happened one day, this happened the next day, this happened the next day. Um, I'm, I'm a little torn on the question of did Jesus show up expecting to do this this day? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Roger, I'd love to hear your feedback on that.
Okay. The challenging part about that to me is, he says, his hour isn't come. What, is, what does that mean, or am I reading that wrong? Yes. Yes. And John clearly, again, if you put the timeline together, if you go all the way back to you know, verse 29 of chapter 1. This all starts when John is, is testifying to some officials who came to see him, John the Baptist. This gets confusing because John the Apostle is recording this. John the Baptist is the one that is, that is doing the, the answering. But John the Baptist is answering to some officials who come to question him um, all the way back in verse 20 through 29. Verse 29, the next day. Verse 35, the next day. Verse 43, the next day. Um, and then our chapter 2 and verse 1 seems to say the third day from that. Um, you put all that together, that's a week. John gives us a pretty good detail of the first seven days of Jesus' kind of public life. It seems to be intentional. Um, John gives us a lot of detail on the last week of Jesus' life. It seems that he's given us quite a bit of detail here on the first week of his public life. Um, I, think, I think that is intentional. Okay, on verse 4, it says, you know, my hour has not yet come. I think it's because he knew about the crucifixion. For sure. So that's why he said my hour. So we have, what does the hour refer to, I think, is a difficult, is it, is it all the way to the end of the crucifixion? Is it some other, as Roger points out, the hour to begin publicly for people to see his glory? That's what I was going to say. I'm not 100% sure if the, the hour has not yet come as John is explaining. Um, of course, he tells the treasuries and pot in the temple, and no one sees him because his hour has not yet come. That one to me is for sure pointing at the crucifixion. But I'm not, I'm not sure this one's not pointing at the hour to manifest himself as Christ the Messiah. Um, uh, which it, technically he, he still almost accomplished this, like in, in the sense maybe, maybe he did. But he really wasn't doing this, hey, put me in the center, and everybody's gonna see this done. He did it except for the servants, like he said, the disciples who already were following him, uh, or the disciples were. The uh, I, I, I think I think he was he was just helping. I think Judy's point earlier that this, this timeline that Jesus was on, um, this kind of divine timeline, Jesus knew the moment that he portrayed himself as the Messiah, what, what had begun. Yeah, every, like, the, the, the multitudes that followed, the blowback from the religious leaders, that drumbeat of this is leading to crucifixion, like, Jesus knew that once once that kind of whatever, once that flame got lit, whatever, like that, there, there was like going to be a progression of time from there, um, and and so I, I I don't know. I wonder if that's on his mind. Is like, are we really? Is this going to start today? Is today is today the day that this ignition gets lit? Um, because that from here on from here on out, I know the steps. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
did. That's correct. My time, I, yeah. As a Christian, I offer our faith. Yeah, I, I made a note about prayer here because I, I think that perhaps there is, there is a, a lesson for us or a, a connection and, and uh, an analogy um, for us about prayer in, in this passage. Again, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be dogmatic about this, but what, what, what you think about, was this, was this part of, did Jesus know this was, or plan for this to happen this day? Um, if, if you go down the road that... that Perhaps he did not intend to begin his miracles this day, but he, he was willing to change his plan in response to his mother. It's kind of an interesting idea. Um, he said, you know, my hour's not yet really come, and yet he, he fulfilled her desires um, that, that she came and said, I have, we have this issue that we can't solve. I, mean, I think there's some, some potential deep meaning there I have this thing I can't solve. The fact, as you teach on prayer in general, just the whole idea that we can affect the will of God is a pretty dramatic and remarkable idea. Like, why, why would God, an all-knowing, all-powerful God, respond to my desires is, is kind of an absurd notion, right? And almost in no other, in no other religion would, would the gods, you know, Listen to the, you know, the desires of, you know, but our, our, what does this tell us about God? Yes. Yeah, there, there, I think that there's a reason that John chooses this event to kind of say this is the first time Jesus showed his glory. What are the, you know, the bigger, and John's good at this, what are the bigger picture implications of this, you know, seemingly just getting somebody out of a social issue, you know, social embarrassment? I think there's a lot more on the bone, to your point. Um, what is this? How is this indicative of Jesus' overall mission? Or what does this tell us about prayer? Like, I think we're missing the point if we say, well, John's just telling us that he, he killed this family from being embarrassed. I, I just think there's way more going on. So there's there's a lot about water, right? A lot about water. I, I will I will I'll go along with that. Yes. 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 Because he loves her. Yes. Someone he loves has made a request, and, and could it be that he changed, he changed his will because somebody he loved had a had a had a honest and sincere request. Man, that is that's really profound stuff. Um, that that God would change his will for somebody that he loves that had a honest and sincere request. Request. Now, the answer may be no. Zach made that point, but Nancy.
Yes. Yeah, does Jesus know everything? The answer is, of course. Um, and yet we have free will. And so, how, how, anyway, that, that's always a challenge. Yes? I think that's a really good point. So, uh, you know, the, the Jesus stamp of approval on weddings and marriages, I think, you know, that, that for sure, we could do a whole thing on that, but I, I think that for sure makes sense. But just the fact that this was, you know, Jesus was in the flesh living a, at least for the last 18 years, living, for all we know, a pretty ordinary, you know, Galilean first century Jewish life in, in complete obscurity. And he was just doing the things that, you know, Galilean Jews did. He was worshiping, and he was working, and he was attending weddings. And, and But now the clock starts, so to speak. I'll come back to you. Yes? Abraham, yeah. Yes? about Abraham and Sodom, yeah. Something that might be a question about that. How does that work? I don't mind, Kent. Um, I know. And it leads me to, it's really good stuff, and it leads me to another thought. Um, Zach says, how many good things do people of the world experience because of the prayers and the lives of Christians, and they don't even recognize that, you know, that that's what's happening. How many people at this wedding enjoyed the glory of Jesus and had no idea? Uh, I, would, I would say many. But, by the way, one of the things I was struck by, I hadn't mentioned this earlier, how much, uh, how much water are we talking about converting into wine here? You may, you may see notes on that. Yeah, if, it, if every one of those jars, by the way, the, reason, the, the fact that he, John specifically mentioned these jars were stone is also significant. Stone uh, vessels are very different in the old law than earthenware vessels. These were taking a significant amount of time to carve out of stone, but they were more permanent. You know, they're good for pure. Anyway, there's a reason they were stone. These, these things, if they hold 30 gallons apiece, I, I, don't, I don't know what, what a firkin goes for on, on the open market these days, but there's, there are a few firkins of water, you know, maybe 30 gallons apiece, 180 gallons of wine. Should tell us a little bit of something about the crowd, um, how significant this event was. I, I bet there's not a person in Cana that's not there. Um, and a little bit about uh, uh, the abundance that Jesus provides. But anyway, I thought that was thought that was interesting. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier about other people knowing more about him. Yeah. Yes. It seems here in verse forty-five, some more of the Jewish body, because when he said uh, a lot of them flee from the country. Yes. 
she does. Mary, again, don't know what Mary expected him to do, but it certainly seems like she knew that he was going to do something. He was going to do something to fix this problem. She brought him a problem she couldn't fix, nobody else could fix. She had confidence he could fix it. Uh, I, I'm going to finish up a point that I, I got distracted. I chased this rabbit, I often do. Um, how many people that were at that wedding benefited from Jesus' glory and had no idea why? They drank the best wine, according to the headmaster. They drank the best wine, and they had no idea that it was the Son of God who provided it for them miraculously. How many people around the world today are benefiting from the prayers of Christians in this room and don't even realize that that's the reason that they are benefiting from them? They're, you're praying for somebody else. Uh, you're praying for something that, it, anyway, I just think there's implications to that. I saw some hands over here. I'll go to Nick first. I'll come back to you. <laughs> I'm assuming not. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> That's right. That's some work. No question. Fill those things up to the brim. Um, that's a lot of water. How much does anybody had to ever sling around a few cases of water? Stuff's heavy. Um, so, I, yeah, something about the blessings of God coming through the work of men involved there. Shane? I mean, the mental acrobatics it takes yeah. to get there are pretty, pretty insightful. I wish I could remember his name. I just read it haphazardly, and I was shaking my head the whole time of how can you be so blind. Yeah. Yeah, good, good stuff. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, again, what would what would you expect Jesus to provide? Um, it's the best, it's the best. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's another, obviously that's another uh, topic of conversation to this is, is, is what, what did Jesus create here and what, what were the intoxicating elements? I, I don't, perfect. Um, <laughs> it probably tastes as good as it can. <laughs> I, I don't want to go down that wormhole too far. I, I would only say wine of the first century seems to be, again, Context, first century, uh, drinking water is a little bit dangerous. There's no purification. There's no, you know, storage of water is a very difficult thing. There's no purification. You don't know what's in there. How are you going to store it? How are you going to make sure it's pure? Drinking wine is a dangerous thing. All kinds of biblical verses about that. Um, there is certainly evidence that there was water mixed with wine to solve both of those purposes. It helped purify, allow for the water to be safe and potable to drink, and it also diluted the effects of the wine so that the uh, intoxicating things that are clearly against God's law could be mitigated. Those things, that is happening. There's no question that's happening in the first century. So I'll just leave that for your, for your consideration. Um, so let's, let's talk briefly about 
question two, and, and, and you know, we kind of, these uh, conclusion kind of questions, what do, we, what do we learn about God here? We've touched on a couple of these. I'll note a couple, and then I would ask you to, uh, to add. The, the fact that perhaps, again, hard to know what all is going on in this account, perhaps the fact that God is willing to bend his will to our request is phenomenal. It's almost incomprehensible. I think that's, that's one. Um, the fact that people enjoy God's blessings without knowing where they came from. I think that's certainly true. We learn that. I think we learn that about God. And we learn that God is always on mission, right? Well, when, when Mary asked for this, you know, again, seemingly just help my friends out of this embarrassing situation, question, what was the first thing on Jesus' mind, it seems? Think about the question she asked versus Jesus' response. The question is, we got a, we're in a pickle. What's Jesus' immediate response? I'll fix it. Well, he, he does get to I'll fix it, but what does he say first? It's not my time. It's not my time for what? Again, it's context, agreed. But what does it appear is on his mind, even in that question, what's on his mind? A father's will. I'm go like ultimately I'm here to get to the cross. How does this seemingly unrelated, insignificant thing affect that? I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into that, but it, it, it appears to me that Jesus answers that question, and his mind goes to, okay, how's this going to affect my timeline between between here and Calvary? It's pretty interesting. Um, he's always on mission. Yes. I do think this, you know, again, if we think about it in that context, this does give us some insight into unanswered prayers, right? That, you know, we can fast and pray and believe that we are praying for the thing that is best. And Jesus' immediate response, right, or his, his thought as God, his immediate response is, what is this, how does this help my mission of saving souls? Um, you know, how... And, and does this fit within that mission? And sometimes the answer is no. Um, and that's a, that's a challenging reality um, to deal with. Really good, really good uh, thoughts and conversation this morning. Appreciate everybody that had, uh, had things to add. Lesson six on Wednesday, Jesus cleansing the temple. We get a little different Jesus uh, here in John, the, the next uh, section in John chapter two. What do we learn about God um, Jesus is the word. What we learn about God in this passage is maybe different than what we studied uh, this morning. Thanks, everybody.